Hi guys, it's Mr. Y. Today we're going to be going over part one of biochemistry. There will be a part two, so make sure you watch both parts. The learning objectives for today will be learning about how monomers relate to polymers, knowing what monomers make up the four major polymers of biology, and then knowing what those four major polymers of biology do. So we'll be going over carbohydrates and lipids slash fats in this lecture. Part two will cover nucleic acids and will especially focus on proteins and finally enzymes and how they work. So let's start off by talking about monomers and polymers. A monomer, if you know the term mono from Latin, means one. So a monomer is a small molecule, one mo uh, unit molecule that can become bonded to other monomers to form a polymer. Now if you know, again, Latin, poly means many. And so a polymer is simply a large molecule composed of many repeating structural units we call monomers, and they're typically held together with covalent bonds. This little picture here down below shows that. And um, the best analogy you can probably come up with in your mind is think of a link and a chain. So the link would be the monomer, the whole chain would be the polymer. So monomer, the link, the polymer, the chain. So here's another example, just another diagram again. So these are your links, here's your chain. So the first polymer we're gonna talk about are carbohydrates. Now carbohydrates themselves are the polymer, those are the chains. Their monomers are called monosaccharides, or simply sugars. So sugars are the links, and when you link them all together, the polymer is called carbohydrates. Um, sugars go by many different names because there's many different types of sugars. There's glucose, galactose, fructose. Um, the chemical composition of most sugars tends to be very similar to this, but not always. Glucose tends to be the most common one, but again, there's lots of different types of monomers of sugars that can make carbohydrates. So um, ribose and deoxyribose, this guy, and this guy are also sugars. Uh, deoxyribose, if you've ever taken biology in any way before, you know deoxyribose is actually the sugar for the D in DNA. Ribose is the R in RNA. So glucose, deoxyribose, fructose, galactose, all those are important sugars. Mono, they call them monosaccharides, but they're monomers. Uh, they're the monomers of carbohydrates. So, like I said, carbohydrates are just chains of sugars. Now, they can be the same sugar, they can be different types of sugar. So, down below here, you have galactose and glucose linking up, or you can have two lactoses over there on the right, or two sucroses. It's going to be a carbohydrate either way. And you can see here, they have different names for the <coughs> disaccharides. These are just disaccharides, meaning two monosaccharides. But as they grow longer and longer, they'll become a carbohydrate. Starch is a very, 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 very common um, carbohydrate. It's found in almost anything you eat composed of plant material, and it's just basically repeating glucose sugars. So glucose is, again, the link, and the whole chain is the carbohydrate. So that's the chain, the carbohydrate right there. So polysaccharide is another term you'll hear thrown around with carbohydrates a lot of times. It just means a chain of three or more sugars or three or more monosaccharides or three or more monomers, if you want to think of it that way. Just three or more links together is a polysaccharide in terms of carbohydrates. So when you have lots of polysaccharides together, that's what generally makes up a carbohydrate. Starch is an example of a carbohydrate. As I said before, plants use starch as their form of long-term energy storage. So to plants, plants don't get fat per se, they get starch. Starch is like the uh, fat for plants. It just holds energy for a long period of time. Glycogen is how animals store energy in terms of carbohydrates, and glycogen though doesn't um, stay stored very long. It's used primarily as what we call quick energy, energy when you need it immediately. So glycogen reserves can be depleted pretty fast and then animal cells have to switch to using fat reserves for energy. Cellulose is another example of um, plants using carbohydrates, but this is this is in terms of their cell structure. So plants use cellulose in terms of their cell walls. This is 
what allows the cell walls to be so rigid, so strong, and to actually stand up vertically against the pull of gravity, even though plants have no muscles and no skeletal structures. So cellulose is actually a pretty strong substance, um, especially in terms of it being used in cell walls. Chitin. Um, I've heard this pronounced chitin. I've heard it pronounced other ways, but it's a polysaccharide found in the cell walls of funguses, and it's also found in the exoskeletons of insects and arthropods. It's waterproof, so it's very, very secure, and it's pretty strong as well. It works pretty well as an exoskeleton for most insects. Now, moving on to our second type of um, polymer, lipids, uh, also known as fats. Lipids are large, they are nonpolar, so they have no charges on them. Organic molecules that do not dissolve in water. If you've ever done any cooking, you know that part already. Their monomers are actually a little bit weird. Unlike the others, they don't necessarily make a nice, neat chain. They're, um, I'll show you a picture in the next slide, but their monomers are three fatty acids and one glycerol molecule. Uh, oils, fats, waxes, steroids, they are all lipid-based, so they don't dissolve in water um, because they are not polar. They don't have any charges on it. They use oxygen uh, very little, and because of this, they tend to store energy very, very easily. So they're great for energy storage, and they're also great for insulation. And they're used a lot of times in the cell's membranes. So here is what a lipid molecule looks like. You have a glycerol, which is right here, but then they've just stretched it out for convenience sake. That's the exact same thing. And then you have three fatty acid chains, one, two, three. So there are two different types of lipids. There's unsaturated fats and there's saturated fats. If you know anything about health and dietary concerns, you've heard these terms before. Uh, unsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature. These are oils. They have a double bond in the carbon chain, which I'll show you in the next slide. The saturated fats are solid at room temperature. They have this um, issue where there's no double bonds compared to the unsaturated fats. So once again, here is what a lipid looks like. It's a glycerol plus three fatty acids, but you can notice this one's a bit different than the last one I showed you. This first fatty acid way up top has a double bond there, which makes it an unsaturated fatty acid. This would be an unsaturated fat. Even though the other two are both straight and in line, they have been filled up with hydrogens, those would be saturated, but this one is unsaturated. So that's unsaturated. And the other ones are saturated. And again, you have the glycerol over here on the left-hand side. So, again, the difference between saturated or unsaturated comes down to the fatty acid tails. If it's unsaturated, it has this double bond, and it tends to have this weird, I would call it a kink, to the tail, so the tail actually takes up more space, whereas a saturated fatty acid is nice and straight in line, it can actually be compressed pretty easily. So because of that, because of that compression, um, saturated fats are solid at room temperature, whereas unsaturated fats, they tend to need more space, so they are liquid at room temperature. Again, these are just two different diagrams of the same basic thing. You can see that first one, there's the kink in the fatty acid tail, that's the unsaturated, and then here are the saturated fatty acid tails. And here on this one, you can see the various kinks there as well, indicating a double bond is present. Now let's talk about how this applies more directly to biology. That comes in the terms of what we call phospholipids. Now phospholipids are what make up the majority of the cell membrane. Now this is a nice little diagram, but these are phospholipids in the little circles here, and this doesn't show the tails too well. We'll see if we find another one. There we go. These are phospholipids, and this is what provides the barrier between the inside and the outside of the cell. There's other things in there, proteins and other little carbohydrate stuff going on, um, but the main medium for the uh, cell membrane are phospholipids. It's what creates the barrier between the inside and the outside of your cells. Here's another picture of phospholipids. Again, you can see there's other things going on here, but you can always see the phospholipids right there with the two uh, fatty acid tails. They're very similar to lipids. Uh, this is actually what a phospholipid looks like chemically. You can see you have the glycerol here, and then fatty acid tails. Sometimes they're saturated, sometimes they're not. 
but then instead of a third fatty acid tail, there's a phosphate, phosphate group. That's why it's called a phospholipid. So phosphate, glycerol, and then your fatty acid chains. So um, you should also note that while most lipids are nonpolar, phospholipids actually do end up having a charge on them. And because of this charge, they tend to stick together. So phospholipids like to stick together in terms of the charges, whereas the tails, the tails really couldn't care less. They have no charges on them. So the positive charge there at the top with the nitrogen and the negative charge there on the oxygen with the phosphate group, those means that the that those mean that these guys are slightly polar, they tend to like to interact with water. That means they are hydrophilic. Hydrophilic means water loving. Remember, water has polar covalent charges on that. So it will love to interact with water. The tails, they don't like to interact with water. They are hydrophobic. And because of this, they tend to want to stay away from water. So phospholipids have this wonderful capacity to orient themselves to where the head, this part up here, orients towards water, the tails orient as away as far as they can from water, and it forms these nice layers naturally. So these layers form perfectly naturally. If you just stick a whole bunch of phospholipids in a drop of water, they will naturally form a layer to where the water-loving head will face towards the water and the tails will face towards each other. So remember, hydrophilic means water-loving, and I'm sorry it's cut off here, but hydrophobic means water-fearing. So the tails are hydrophobic, the heads are hydrophilic. So this is another version, it's just the same repetition of this uh, idea. Hydrophilic heads towards the water, hydrophobic tails away from the water. Very important concept for understanding how the cell membrane works. And remember, this is still technically a lipid, even though it does have charges. Most lipids, as I said, don't have charges, but phospholipids, because of that phosphate group, they do. All right, now let's talk about the functions of lipids. Uh, as I said before, lipids can often be called fats, and fats are always, always used in biology as a place to store energy when times are hard, when food is naturally scarce, or when you're a uh, bird and you have to travel very far, or a deer or anything like that, and you have to migrate. So they are energy storage. Keep in mind, they're also there for energy storage to fuel rapid growth. So babies, healthy babies, are always born with an excess amount of fat to help fuel their growth needs. Another function of lipids or fat is as insulation against cold weather. Keep in mind, um, all the pictures you see here are mammals, so they have to keep their body temperature stable. And to do that, they have to have some form of insulation. Well, insulation comes in the form of fat. Um, with many, it's just regular adipose fat, and then some, it's um, a special type of fat with marine animals, mammals, excuse me, called blubber. Um, it also applies in much of their milk, too. That works there more as an energy storage than as insulation, but the milk for uh, mammals in the northern areas is much, much higher in fat contents than it is in um, mammals of the equatorial regions. So that's part one. Part two will cover uh, nucleic acids and proteins and enzymes. Make sure you watch both parts and ask questions if you need help, guys.